morning, good evening, good good to who needs it. Um, come have some tea with me. Sorry, I shifted things around a little bit so it'd be a little bit easier to hear me. I very quickly became overwhelmed researching this topic because tea is one of those things so embedded in society that it's almost impossible to give a quick summary of any of it. It's the second most popular drink worldwide after water, with tea culture being a subsection of nearly every country and with tea referring to a wide variety of possible drinks. The world is obsessed with tea, whether it is for medical purposes, relaxation, thirst, we look at tea to be calming, to be invigorating, to be cooling, to be warming. It's one of the most complex relationships we have as a species to a common foodstuff. As an aside, I recently saw someone called out online and it amused me. They were talking about how the word for meal in many Asian languages essentially translates to rice. To which someone else chimed in, what do you think meal is? I've always wondered what the ideal food stuff is. I remember being little and thinking, if certain animals only eat certain things, if koalas are that into eucalyptus, is there something ideal for humans that we've just evolved to be our best diet? Obviously, it's enormously variant. Common foodstuffs are rare, but humans have penchants for grains, herbs, vegetation, domesticated livestock. Much of it is based on what is indigenous or is available to most people in a given area. Just because a food is indigenous doesn't mean that the ruling classes or colonizers let you have it. Tea travels the world. Tea plants can live. You can use the same bushes for centuries. Tea plants transplanted to the Americas in the 1700s are still producing tea, being widely consumed in the Americas today. The plantations change hands, but the tea is the same. Tea, or really any brute plant, holds a special place in so many societies. Tea, chai, shai, has so many different meanings. I'm really interested in how tea specifically has so many ceremonies attached to it. It's almost as if we view making tea, whether it's a simple worker's cup or a full three-hour Chinese tea ceremony, with a certain magic. It's alchemy, for transforming water into something else. I always overbrew tea. I almost never check the recommended times, and if I do, I probably just go, huh, and I don't follow it. And I squeeze the tea bag, which some people get really weird about, and that always annoys me. What do you care about how I like or drink tea? My dad didn't even know what tea was anything other than a powdered mix until he was in college in Mexico. Tea isn't a part of everyone's lives in the same way. People vary, cultures vary. So why do we police tea? People do. People do care. So let's talk about it. First, why was I researching tea? Fantastic question. Thank you for definitely asking. In working on a fantasy novel, I was trying to think of what aspects of culture are absolutely essential. What do we need in the world building? And a lot of fantasy novels rely on familiar food. A lot of fantasy novels feature specific food, food that the reader can eat as a celebration of their love of that novel or bond with others who like that novel. Um, there's a lot of time devoted in fantasy novels to feasting, and that's on purpose. This is true of all fiction, by the way. Uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas should make you think of grapefruit and banana daiquiris. On the Road is all about apple pie. But in fantasy and sci-fi, food is the building block of the world. It's working backwards to create a society. If you're writing a story, you should always be asking what your characters are eating. Are they well-fed? Are they starving? Do they have a favorite, a least favorite? In standard fiction, the food lets you in. In sci-fi and fantasy, the food lets you relate. Culture thrives on food. Think about how many travel shows are really just you watching a presenter eat. Almost exclusively. Sitting and having a meal with someone is love. It's also tension. It's a way of bringing people together, essential to our survival. In many cultures, a common greeting is equivalent to, have you eaten? So when you're creating a culture, to make it real, you have to create the food. You have to create meal times. You have to create greetings based on that food. You have to think about more. You have to think about the climate access, what grows in this world, what doesn't, what's expensive, what isn't. Food is the base of world building. T 
tea is native to East and South Asia and the Indian subcontinent and comes from the tea bush, which, as I mentioned before, can survive an extremely long time through maintenance and as such, a hardy bush can be transplanted and grafted to multiple environments. However, that does impact flavor. Many higher quality teas are grown in higher elevations and the plant thrives best, the original untampered with tea bush, does best in tropical and subtropical climates. Why tell you that? Because tea is very widely traveled and its spread and popularity in unusual climates is related directly to colonization and because of how police tea culture can be, that takes another sinister turn. Let's dunk on Queen Victoria. If I end up making a lot of these video essays, then you're going to learn something about me and it's that I've written a lot on the Victorian impact of modern culture and I hate it. There isn't a lot I can think of a link back to the British Empire, which we think of as common practice, common belief today in the United States, whether it be the belief that the Dark Ages, the medieval period, was remarkably backwards, which came from Victorian propaganda of industrial advancement, uh, breastfeeding versus bottle feeding being a debate rather than a choice, which we can blame on Victorians promoting bottle feeding but not promoting healthy formula, resulting in severe illnesses and infant death. A lot of what you think about traditional gender roles, Victorian, Victorians were just great at making shit up and pretending that that's the way it's always been. And because of the Industrial Revolution, it spread across the empire and became part of a world culture. Back to tea. No one knows when tea was first introduced in England. However, Queen Victoria initiated the concept of high tea or afternoon tea being an upscale social event and invented much of the etiquette around it. Afternoon tea, or high tea, previously just referred to as a midday meal sometime between lunch and evening, to tide you over until supper. It's still widely used as such in England and some former colonies. However, especially in the United States, there's a misconception that high tea refers to a high status event. That's because, in part, the American rejection of tea culture during the revolution, which made tea much less popular. Americans began to and still favor coffee as our second most consumed drink after water. High tea is tea eaten at a high table, or a dinner table. That's it. It's sitting down for a larger snack, basically, presented as a meal. It was likely first introduced in the court of King Charles II because his wife liked it and tea was included in her dowry. At that time, tea was extremely expensive because of shipping costs. As it grew in popularity in England, though, more cultivars were brought into England and it became the common beverage. It's also widely promoted as medicinal, especially when adding milk, which was initially done to make tea better suit the English palate and cool the tea down, but later claimed health benefits and superiority over how tea was consumed by Asian populations. They told people it prevented consumption. It doesn't. Afternoon tea etiquette, which, as many things we have the Victorians to blame for, has several variations, often paired in certain combinations, but included particular finger sandwiches, scones, a fruit, and a chocolate to accompany tea, uh, and the etiquette of much of how each thing is consumed, the order of the presentations, are all signs of status. Queen Victoria popularized this by inviting people to tea with her as a means of socializing among the court, mainly to gossip. Which leads us to the infamous story of Queen Victoria and Lady Floral Hastings. Also, as an aside, Tea gained a reputation for being feminine during this time period, because the 1700s to today were all about making up weird gender roles. Because of this association, however, afternoon tea became the perfect venue for high society ladies to gossip and be a catty high society asshole. Lady Floral Hastings was unpopular among the court because she was highly educated and apparently unafraid to demonstrate it. She was known to be witty and not to hold back. Lady Flora was unmarried and suspected of having an affair with John Conroy, whom she scandalously rode in a carriage with alone from Scotland to London. The women, having afternoon tea with Queen Victoria, ate the gossip up, and it caused a stir, especially as John Conroy was rumored to be the lover of the Duchess of Kent, who happened to be Queen Victoria's mother. Queen Victoria had an estranged relationship with her mother and tried to keep her distance from her in court. The Duchess of Bedford, sometimes regarded as the creator of afternoon tea and Queen Victoria's lifelong friend, stirred up rumors when it was disclosed that Lady Flora had been seeing the royal surgeon for complaints of abdominal swelling. 
Immediately, the afternoon tea circles went ablaze with spreading rumors that Lady Flora was pregnant. The Queen even wrote that she suspected the father to be Conroy, whom she openly despised for his connection to her mom. Queen Victoria made Lady Flora's life so difficult, she felt the need to defend herself publicly in written letter, insisting that she was a virgin and accusing members of the court of spreading rumors, in particular, the two best friends of Queen Victoria. It became clear that something was very wrong, and Lady Flora finally consented to a full medical examination to prove her innocence, which revealed she was not pregnant. She had cancer. On June 27, 1839, Queen Victoria visited the outcasted Lady Flora, who was by then very clearly dying. Lady Flora died July 5, 1839, aged 33. The abdominal swelling had been the result of liver tumors. Egypt break. The Egyptian diet was extremely high in wheat and barley. Their bread is said to have been a large part of their widespread documented tooth decay. Most commonly, Egyptians would drink beer, which was made by taking barley and partially baking it into a dough uh, in a large clay pot, then taking it out and breaking it up into water with sweeteners that were usually based in pomegranate. Tea wasn't widely introduced into Egypt, despite being very prevalent in the surrounding Middle East and Asia, obviously, until the 16th century. It is today one of the most widely drunk beverages in Egypt. It's considered an everyday, all day, morning, noon, and night type beverage. It's second only to water. So you may think that I kind of did this in a strange order, but I wanted to give more time and importance to talking about tea ceremonies, specifically in China, where tea originates. So I made a point of talking about England first a bit because I'm more familiar with that. And I really wanted to take my time to make sure I was being respectful and do a, a deep dive into Chinese tea ceremony. Tea ceremonies are meant to elevate the experience of tea from drinking to tasting. It's a very mindful practice, which takes dedication. According to legend, tea was discovered by Shenong, a mythical Chinese ruler credited as the first Yan emperor, who then became a deity in Chinese and Vietnamese folk religion. In Chinese mythology, Shenong taught the Chinese how to use the plow, irrigation, and many other agricultural practices, as well as herbalism. Shenong is said to have poisoned himself many times, experimenting with various herbs to determine all herbal properties, discovering plants for medicine and cookery, including tea. Chinese tea ceremonies have held cultural significance for literally over a thousand years, influencing Japanese, Korean, and other East Asian tea culture. Tea making is considered an elegant pursuit. The ceremony is a spiritual harmony between humans and nature, and in the Tang and especially Song dynasties, this led to tea competitions, tasting competitions, and even tea fighting. Elite manhood was tied in the Tang and Song dynasties to refined values. China was becoming prosperous. As the economy thrived, efforts were made to encourage cultural development. Tea was accessible, and up until that time, it hadn't been taxed. So with tea being an elegant spiritual pursuit accessible to many, and with the budding cultural revolution, making tea in ceremony, winning competitions, and tea fighting all proved one's manliness and value to society. A unique economic product, tea became an increasing proportion of country-to-country -country trade and a symbol of China. Now, with nationalism also in the mix, tea only gained cultural importance. Driven by demand, in the Tang Dynasty there was a burst of tea tech. Now there was material tea, loose tea, powdered tea, and cake tea, which made tea production and consumption soar in the Song Dynasty. This also allowed wider distribution and trade, as well as grades of tea and implied social status. Tea became an elite drink. So obviously, tea fighting piqued my interest because I have to know. Without researching it yet, it made me think of the legend Drunken Master with Jackie Chan. I just imagined a smooth, surprisingly agile battle carried out while nonchalantly making tea. Obviously, that's not what this is and just goes to highlight the ignorance in the West. Tea fighting is 
so much more and so much cooler than what I had imagined. The Tang Dynasty, where tea fighting originates, is considered the golden age of Chinese arts and culture. Wu Tong, who lived from 790 to 835 AD, wrote the following poem. Seven Cups of Tea One boil moistens the lips and throat, two bowls shatters loneliness and melancholy, three bowls thinking hard, one produces five thousand volumes, four bowls lightly sweating, the inequities of a lifetime disperse toward the pores, five bowls cleanses the muscles and tendons, six bowls accesses the realm of spirit, one cannot finish the seventh bowl, but feels only a light breeze spring up under the arms. With ancient China flourishing in the Tang Dynasty, there are a large number of artifacts that tell us things about how tea played a role. The poem Seven Bowls of Tea or Seven Cups of Tea is kind of ubiquitous to the point of being useless. I saw a resource that called it the Live Laugh Love of Chinese Tea. But it endures, and it has reached over th a thousand years to us now. Another poem by Wei Yingyu uh, of the Tang Dynasty lived from 618 to 907 AD, called Joy at Seeing Tea Growing in the Garden. Its pure nature cannot be sullied. When drunk, it cleanses dust and worries. This plant has a truly divine taste and originates in the mountains. After I have taken care of my responsibilities, I plant a tea bush in my uncultivated garden. It is happy to grow with other vegetation and to speak with a person in solitude. Translation comes from Tea in China, a religious and cultural history. Tea was the cornerstone of connecting to others. It was a cornerstone of being able to communicate. So then what was tea fighting? I've already answered my own question. It's about refinement and elegance within the Tang Dynasty. Tea fighting is a competition of who can make the most frothy, wonderful, elegant cup of tea in the most artistically pleasing way to watch. I called it a cornerstone. So what is a cornerstone? Check this shit out. The term time capsule was not around until the 1930s. It was actually coined during the 1930s World Fair where the first quote-unquote time capsule was put together, including microfilm and a letter from Albert Einstein buried at the fairgrounds and unearthed in the future. They overshot it. It was way too far in the future. But the reason cornerstone, the, what cornerstone really means when somebody says that something is the cornerstone, the way that I did for tea, time capsules used to be kept in buildings. What we would today call a time capsule is what would have then been a cornerstone. So tea and its relevance is a glimpse into life then. These ceremonies are a glimpse into life that were purposefully left for the future to show the elegance and power and creativity of spirit in ancient China. Here, let me get you just, you know, turned back around. So what are my conclusions? And I, I, I feel the need to say that these are my own conclusions based on my research into the topic. You're more than welcome to disagree. That's why they're my conclusions. So remembering the whole thesis statement of this was in trying to create a new culture and trying to create a fantasy culture, you have to draw from what already exists. You have to find cultural touchstones, things that people are going to latch onto and immediately recognize. And tea, or some analogous hot beverage, is a good place to start. It's good to have Captain Janeway go looking for coffee. It lets people feel a kinship. It lets people feel a connection. There's a humor and humanity to that. But there's also something pretty sinister when you look at the extreme fetish around tea specifically. 
what this reminds me of, and I realize that I am not normal, is Julius Caesar's Debello Gallico. In Debello Gallico, Caesar outlines devious but exceptionally clever plan for how to incorporate conquered peoples into the Roman Empire. It feels as though the English Empire saw the incredible importance of tea in Eastern cultures, which they hoped to overtake, and felt that they needed to entwine that with their own culture in order to better assimilate people into England. It seems backwards. We're used to this idea in America of Americanization, assimilation, which has its own horrid, long backstory that could take ages and doctorates to explain. But this particular example feels like the reverse, and it feels like Julius Caesar. He made everyone a citizen of Rome automatically. There was no division, and because there was no division, Gallic practices became Roman practices. Roman practices became Gallic practices. The spread of the empire was based on incorporation. The people in Gaul were allowed to continue in their own language. The people in Gaul were allowed to incorporate their gods into the polytheistic religions of Rome. If you think about British colonizers, looking at China and looking at India and looking at Japan and seeing all of these prosperous lands in the East and saying to themselves, how do we make ourselves impossible to extract? They looked at the ceremony of tea and they said, aha, it is a cultural touchstone. Let's make it one of our cultural touchstones as well. And then we'll all be a little bit more alike, and we'll all be a little bit more part of the Empire. And I didn't even mention India. Oh, shit. If you liked this, like it, and I will be happy to make more and talk more and create more long essays like this. Hopefully my editing skills get even better because this is a, a trial by fire situation. I will be putting out more story times, the blog updates on Saturdays. I will be putting out more did you knows. And hopefully we learn a little bit and we grow. <laughs> Thanks for listening. For more information on this topic, sources, and other content, please look at the associated blog post on aliactus.com. That's A-L-I-A-C-T-A-S-T dot com. The blog updates with weekly book reviews and essays on Saturdays. If you liked this, like it and share whatever you feel you gotta do. There are monthly video essays the last week of every month and a plethora of random shit in between. Thank you so much for listening.